Hey guys, Will here. So today we're gonna to be taking a look at D-Box's brand new G5-4250i 1.5 inch travel motion system for your sim rig. Now, we've been running the G3 system on our main daily driver rig for quite some time now. Now the G5 system sees a couple of important upgrades from the G3 as well as a significant price drop. So today we're gonna to be checking it out in detail, finding out whether this is the motion system for you. Let's get started. Okay, so to begin with a couple of important housekeeping things. Firstly, big thank you to D-Box for sending across this G5 system and of course their G3 system which they sent us about 18 months ago now to test out and put through its paces. Now in today's video, we're gonna be making some direct comparisons between this system and plenty of other motion systems that we've tested over the years here at Boosted Media. If you head on over to boostedmedia.net, you'll find all of those reviews. You can search for them and there'll also be some links down in the description below of this video. And as always, if you do decide you wanna pick up any of the gear that you see in today's video, we also also have some affiliate links on the website which are a great way of helping support our work here at Boosted Media. So we really appreciate your support there. But with that stuff all covered now, let's take a dive into the G54250i D-Box motion system. So let's start off by talking about pricing. I know that's something that a lot of people are going to be wondering about. Now if you remember back to the G3 system, there are a few different models available of that depending on how much travel you wanted. Now my advice is that 1.5 inches of travel, which is the same as what we have here, is more than enough for the majority of people. And you understand why by the end of today's video when we go for a drive a little bit later on. But the 4250i G3 system, so the equivalent amount of travel as what we have here with the new G5 system, that had two different models available depending on what region you're in. So if you're in a 120 volt region, then the price was $8,770 US dollars. That was the MSRP. So obviously taxes and shipping costs, things like that were going to be on top of that. If you happen to be in a 220 volt region like what we have here in a Australia, the price was significantly more at 9,370 uh, US dollars MSRP. Now, of course, you do have the option of running some sort of an inverter system to run the lower voltage version, but those are quite expensive as well. So it is going to be an additional expense regardless of what you're doing. Now with the G5 system, they've moved away from that two separate module type arrangement, but there's a little slider here. I'll flip this around the other way so you can see it the right way up. And that allows you to select between 120 volts or 230 volts, depending on your region. So it's now one unit for everybody, and the price for the G5 system is significantly cheaper, although still quite expensive, at 7,100 US dollars MSRP. And again, of course, add taxes and shipping costs, depending on where you are in the world, on top of that. Now, while we're still discussing pricing, one important thing to note is that we did see a couple of deals from various different resellers. I remember SimLab had a deal where if you purchased a G3 system and you already owned a P1X, they give you the equivalent value of the P1X as a cashback. And if you bought a P1X cockpit with a G3 motion system, they effectively threw in the cockpit for free. So not aware of exactly what deals are gonna be going with the G5 system, but definitely do your research there. Again, we do have some links down in the description below as well as on our website, boostedmedia.net, for some of our affiliate partners with regards to that. So definitely check those out to make sure you're getting the best deal. So let's take a look at exactly what we have here now. So if you're not aware, the 4250i is a full cockpit motion system. So what that means is that it moves your entire cockpit. And if you have your monitors fixed to your cockpit, it is capable of moving those as well. We'll talk about weight limits a little bit later on today. So essentially what you have is a little control box like this that plugs into your PC. So you've got a USB connection on the front there. You've got a power connection. And then on the back side, you've got four network ports or RJ45 ports. Those are gonna connect to each individual actuator. Now there are a few different configurations available here. What we're gonna be testing today is the 4250i system which consists of four actuators. So you're gonna have one of these in each corner of your SIM rig and they are individually coded. So you do have to pay attention to what positions you install them in, but otherwise they are identical other than just that coding. Uh, so essentially you have an actuator like this in each corner of the SIM rig. It bolts onto the side sits on the ground like that. There's a little non-captive cup that sits underneath. And what happens is the bottom of this comes up and down by an inch and a half. And that is what provides the motion in your cockpit. So the entire cockpit can move around front to back, left to right and up and down. So you've got pitch, roll and heave or three degrees of freedom there. So 
essentially it operates in the same manner as the G3 system did previously. And for all intents and purposes, the actual experience of using it in the context of sim racing is exactly the same. So let's actually unpack that now in a little bit more detail and run through some of the key specs for you guys. So maximum lifting capacity per corner of 250 pounds or 114 kilograms. So you do need to pay attention to weight distribution when you install this on your rig. You wanna try and have the weight as central or as balanced across all four corners as you possibly can. Now that can be a little bit tricky in a sim rig because obviously the uh, your body weight is towards the rear of the rig, but as long as you get it as balanced as you possibly can, you shouldn't have any issues and we certainly didn't run into any issues. There's plenty of headroom there at 114 kilograms per corner. In most cases, you shouldn't have any problem having the weight of the driver, the weight of the rig, and even the weight of the monitors if you wanna integrate everything and have everything move together in unison. So I've got a maximum stroke or total range of movement bottom to top of 1.5 inches or 38.1 millimeters. And as you'll see later on in today's video, that is more than enough travel in my opinion at least. You can see just how much that is able to throw us around. Maximum velocity of 100 millimeters per second, maximum acceleration of plus or minus one force of gravity or one G. Uh, frequency range of naught to 100 hertz, operating temperature range of naught to 40 degrees. So if you are running in a tiny little room without any air conditioning, you may run into issues. Unlikely, but something just to be aware of there. It's not the highest temperature range I've ever seen. Then we've got operating humidity range of 10 to 85% free from condensing, which is actually up a little bit on the G3, which was 10 to 50%. So if you are running in a damp environment, this is a little bit less susceptible to problems. And that is primarily because of the kind of enclosed design that we have here with cable grommets and things like that. Now I'm sure there will be some people that are wondering whether it's worth upgrading from a G3 to a G5 system. So let's cover off the differences there. We already talked about the fact that the operation specs are essentially exactly the same. So the user experience is gonna be the same between them. So what are the differences? Now basically, as we saw before, we've got the control module and then we connect to each individual corner of our rig. So unlike the G3, which was essentially just four actuators and then a large control module, which you had to find somewhere to mount on your rig. We now have the control electronics and the power supply for each actuator actually as part of the assembly here. So you can see the form factor of this is actually quite significantly larger than the G3 was. And then we have two thinner cables coming out of it, one of which is an RJ45 connection or a network connection that is gonna plug into the control module. And then we've also got an IEC power connection here as well. So you're going to have to run power to each corner as well as run the network cable back. And they do include some splitters and power cables in the box. So that's not too much of an issue. So if you go back and have a look at our installation video of the G3, you'll see it had a really thick cable that came out of a metal gland and that had a really, really shallow bend radius. So it was quite difficult to handle cable management with the G3 system in addition to having to have that big control module, those two big control modules mounted somewhere nearby on the rig. So with this, you've got two thin cables. It can get a little bit messy. They don't unfortunately include any uh, any cable management provision, but the fact that these cables are thinner makes it a lot easier to manage these on your rig. Now, one thing just that I will call out here is the fact that these cables do pass through grands directly into the control electronics. So you don't have any plugs on here. What that does mean, unfortunately, is that if you do damage one of these cables, you're gonna be up for a repair rather than just replacing the cable. So if we compare that to say the Sigma Integrale system, for example, one of the things that I really liked about that was the fact that those cables are replaceable. If you damage one, you just replace it and you're good to go again. So I did actually ask them about that. They said that the reason for doing it was primarily because a IEC or a power cable receptacle basically like that. If you can imagine trying to fit that inside the box as well is gonna add quite a bit of bulk. So they were trying to stay away from that. You can see a little ferrite choke here as well. Now those do rattle around a little bit. So I found when I was using the rig, those did vibrate. What I ended up doing was actually just sliding those cable ties up a little bit further to secure that a little bit better in place. You could wrap it with electrical tape or something like that as well if it is bothering you. So not a major deal, but just one little thing that I did notice. But let's just quickly give you the dimensions of this as well, because I know that's gonna be important for some people. It is a little bit more difficult to find space on your rig because you can imagine you've got to have this kind of beside it. Now you can orient these in any direction. So you can have it facing forward or facing backwards on your rig. It's just gonna purely depend on your installation. But the housing itself is 7.34 inches or 186.5 millimeters across the top. 
and then 10.76 inches from top to bottom, obviously in the fully collapsed position, and that is 273.26 millimeters. And then the actuator portion itself here, if we look from the top down, 3.33 inches or 84.57 millimeters across, and 3.39 inches or 66 millimeters from top to bottom. So you shouldn't have too many problems mounting this on your rig, I don't think. We certainly didn't with our advanced sim racing AS4, which we've been testing this with, but it definitely is gonna stand out more on your rig, which some people are gonna like. Obviously, if you're spending this kind of money on a piece of hardware, you kind of want it to stand out. But having said that, I do quite like the small form factor of the actuators on the G3 system because I was able to hide those control modules pretty much entirely on my particular rig. Now, in terms of mounting, you can see there's four holes, two on either side, of the base of the actuator here. What that does is it bolts into these included mounting brackets. So this sits on the side of your rig, bolts in in a upper, middle or lower position. And then there's four M6 holes on the back of this bracket, which actually line up perfectly with the channels on standard 40 series profile. So you can imagine it just bolts onto the side of your rig like so. Now, one thing that I was a little bit surprised by was the fact that these holes that are pre-drilled in the bracket are only M6 or six millimeters thick. So the mounting face here is quite large. There's plenty of clamping force between this and your rig. So look, we didn't have any issues running M6 bolts, but if it does bother you, you can of course just drill those holes out to M8. And if you're wondering, this is a three millimeter thick piece of steel, not including the powder coating. Now in terms of the actuators themselves, we've got a full metal construction. I believe it is aluminum because a magnet doesn't stick to it at all, unlike the mounting bracket, which it does, but it could also be stainless steel. I'm not 100% certain there, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, the important thing here is that you can see we do have some heat sink built into here. So we've got increased surface area across the actuator itself, as well as the control electronics. We've got these little studs, which increase the surface area and help to bleed off a little bit of excess heat. Now it does generate quite a bit of heat here, particularly the control module. If you reach down and touch it, it does feel warm to the touch in operation, but certainly not hot, certainly not gonna burn you. And there seems to be enough provision here for cooling completely passively. It doesn't need any cooling fans or anything like that. And in terms of other hardware included, they do give you a 1.8 meter long USB cable to run between the control module and your PC. And if you do need a little bit of extra length, they give you a nice high quality three meter long USB extension cable too. So that was very much appreciated. They also do include bolts to mount the actuators themselves to the mounting brackets, although there aren't any bolts included to bolt the mounting brackets to your rig, also no T-nuts either. So you will need to provide those for yourselves. The reason for that is obviously that different rigs are gonna require different mounting hardware and it's impossible to include something that's gonna suit everybody. Most people that have an aluminum profile cockpit should have a couple of extra M6 T-nuts and a couple of extra M6 bolts as well. So it shouldn't be an issue, but just make sure you have those bits and pieces on hand before you start the installation to avoid any last minute runs to the hardware store. Remembering again, that that the uh, thickness of this mounting bracket is three millimeters. So you're gonna need three millimeters plus whatever mounting depth you have on your particular rig. They also do include a couple of Y-splitter IEC cables to run power to each of the actuators. That just avoids having to run multiple cables all the way back to your wall outlet or your power board. There is an external power supply for the USB control module. And then they also include some nice silver painted aluminum non-captive cups to sit underneath each of the actuators. So you're gonna place that on the ground and then the actuator is gonna sit inside that and that allows it to move around from side to side a little bit without any problems. Now you wanna obviously try to minimize the amount of angle that you have on this, that does increase the load on the actuators and can damage them over time. But you can imagine as the rig tilts from side to side, there is gonna be a little bit of inherent side to side movement. So this allows for that without it grinding up against the ground or whatever surface it might be sitting on. So before we move on into taking a more detailed look at the software and of course the all important driving experience, just wanna cover a couple of important updates and new features to the D-Box ecosystem. Now it's important for you guys to understand that these features aren't specific to the G5. So these aren't reasons to upgrade from a G3 to a G5 system. If you own a G3 already, you also do have access to these as of a more recent update. So there's a couple of things to cover here and we will be taking a more detailed look at these, not only later on in today's video, but in future videos. So the first one is adaptive gaming mode that allows you to set up effects based off inputs on your sim rig or on your PC. So even if you're playing something like Call of Duty, for example, you can set up a gunshot effect so that every time you press a certain key on your keyboard, you feel a jolt through the rig. So that's really
really cool. Allows you to have those kinds of effects outside the realm of just games that output telemetry data, which can be used to generate the effects that you would normally associate with a motion system. So that's really cool. There's also an audio mode available as part of that as well. That takes the audio output from the PC and uses that to create audio based effects, similar to what you might have if you were running a transducer or something like a butt kicker gamer on a console, for example. So obviously not the same level of experience as properly generated effects would be, but you know, something's better than nothing. So that is a cool feature as well. There's also a new D-Box coded video option now too. Now that is a subscription based service. You get a two month free trial when you first install the software. After that, it costs 89 US dollars per year to remain subscribed. That gives you access to properly generated effects for a growing library of movies. They tell me 2,200 movies, TV series, music clips, and so forth have already been profiled. And so basically what they do is they take the, they take the content, they generate an effects profile for that specific content so that you're getting the best experience. And obviously that's something that they do for their cinema installations as well. So it's cool that we get access to those kinds of things at home. When you're paying this kind of money for a motion system, whether or not you're willing to pay extra just to get access to that is another question. I guess if you've got the money for this, $89 per year probably isn't gonna be all that significant to you. And obviously there is a lot of time involved in actually generating those effects. It's not something that just happens in real time. And again, all of these new features are also available on the G3. So if you do own one of those, you can already check those out. So I think it's time we head on over to the SimRig and get into some testing. While we're doing that, why don't you head on down and hit that like button if you're finding this video interesting and make sure that you're subscribed as well. Okay, so D-Box G5 is mounted up on our advanced sim racing AS uh, for SimRig, which we are going to be reviewing very soon on the channel as well if you're interested in seeing more about that. So everything went on nice and cleanly, no issues at all to speak of other than just the little things that we talked about in the earlier part of the video. But let's talk about the software configuration, how we get everything up and running now. And we'll go through at a top level and show you what you're in for if you buy one of these rigs. So we're going to go back to our Bible, which is the quick start guide. And we've got everything installed now. You can see on the left-hand side, that was our installation instructions for mounting and for wiring. Very simple and straightforward to follow. So let's go over to the software and system configurations. There's a couple of things that you're gonna to wanna to download here. Again, it's pretty straightforward to follow through. So first step here, go to dbox.com software and downloads, which we have on this tab. And we're gonna download the motion core, which includes the drivers, the control panel, the game center, adaptive gaming configurator, the system monitor, the motion engine, and the haptic sync app. And you'll notice when we get into this, there's quite a few different applications that actually run here to, I guess, make various different elements of the system work. So we're gonna download that single package which will install all of these bits and pieces. We're also gonna download the system configurator app. Don't need to worry about the live motion SDK just to get up and running at a basic level. So we're gonna skip that for now. And then we're gonna go back over to our quick start guide. So we're gonna extract and install motion core on the computer that will be connected to your motion system. And then it's for additional information, read the help section. So we've got that installed. Then we're gonna install the system configuration tool as well. So again, we already downloaded that, extract the compressed file and run the install. User guide is provided in the compressed file. Connect your haptic sync bridge to your PC with the USB cable provided. Remember again, they do include that extension cable as well, which we did have to use, and that came in very handy. We did find that the D-Box had some issues initializing when we had it connected through a USB hub. Obviously your experience may vary there, but that was one issue that we had. Okay, so with all the software packages installed, next step here is the firmware update process. So we're gonna open up the D-Box system configurator app. Uh, that is a separate executable to some of the other ones that we're gonna be looking at today. So we're gonna click on the firmware update tab and we can see here all of the various different modules that are connected. So we've got the haptic bridge, which is what connects to our PC via USB. And then underneath that, you can see the various different modules contained within the system all communicating correctly with the haptic bridge. So at the moment it says no action required. We already have the most up-to-date firmware installed, but if we did need to upgrade the firmware, this would be where we would do that. And then configuration update, your haptic bridge comes with a blank configuration. You need to configure your haptic bridge to match your haptic system configuration using the system configurator. And that's all pretty automated. And then the last step here is you need to create a D-Box account. Now it used to be the case that you could get up and running offline without creating an account with my old G3 system, but they have now updated that software and it is universal across the G3 as well. And one of the things you actually need to get up and running, which we'll see in just a minute, is you need to download the Motion Core software for each individual sim racing title, which you're gonna be using. And you can't actually download those anymore unless you have an account. So it is actually mandatory now that you have an account 
to get up and running in the first place. So that may bother some people. I don't personally like having to sign up for things. And another thing I did notice is when I signed up here, it did automatically sign me up for the trial of their coded video, which we'll look at in just a minute too. So there is a trial period there. I'm not sure exactly what's gonna happen at the end of that trial period, whether I'm gonna have to opt out. I didn't have to put any payment information in though. So obviously they're not gonna be able to charge me or anything like that. Wasn't super happy about having to physically sign up for something just to get up and running, but it does seem to be the way things are these days with a lot of products, so it is what it is. So that is everything we need from the quick start guide now. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna open up the DBox Game Center software. Now, the first time you open this up, it's gonna give you a prompt to sign in or create an account if you haven't already. That's a very straightforward process. All you need to do is just give it your email address and basic contact details. Again, no payment information is required. You create the account, verify the account, and you can get up and running. So the first screen you're gonna see is this Game Center control panel, and you'll see a list of all the titles that you've got installed highlighted on the left-hand side here, and a status here, and you can see some of these have got motion code not found listed there, and I'll explain exactly what that is in just a minute for you guys. And then down below, you can see all the other games which are supported, but not installed on your PC, which are grayed out. Now across the top here, you'll see tabs for DBox coded gaming. That means games where they've actually created a configuration for the game and actually coded in the haptic feedback, so it's the optimum experience. Then you also have coded video, and we referenced this just before. This is beyond the scope of today's video, but we might do a separate video looking into this in more detail. But basically what this is is a top level is the ability to watch videos and movies that have actually been coded for the D-Box system. Remembering again that D-Box was actually originally intended for use in cinemas to give you haptic feedback in the seat. So you can actually watch movies in your sim rig and have it all move as if you were at the cinema, which is pretty darn cool. But we'll explore that in another video later on. Adaptive gaming is another option here as well. So unlike the coded gaming where everything's actually configured and profiled for each individual game, this allows you to actually set up your own effects. So say for example, you're playing something like Call of Duty duty and you want to have a you know a shock every time you fire the trigger or something like that you can set all those kinds of things up and we will explore that in more detail a little later on too and then we have a global settings tab here as well and if we hit the control panel button that's going to open up another box which I'll drag down so you can see it and this allows us to check that the system is fully functional and adjust some top level settings here so we can see our D-Box haptic bridge is connected we can hit the test button here as well and it's gonna take us for a little ride. So you can see I go down, I go up, I tilt back, I tilt forward, and it's gonna do a weird kind of frequency sweep in a moment too. Whoa. <laughs> you can see just how much haptic feedback there is in the system. That's really vibrating me around quite violently there, but we're gonna hit stop on that for now, and it should return us back to the center position. So everything's obviously functional there. You'll know pretty quickly whether it's uh, off center or whether you've got things installed incorrectly. We've got some basic default settings here as well, which kind of work like a master control for the individual profiles that you set up for each game. So you can see we've got a global intensity level, vibration balance, output buffer latency, platform optimization, actuator stroke, and default mode. And there are tool tips here that explain what each one of these things do. There's so many things to go through today though. I do want to keep this as top level as I possibly can. But again, just to reiterate here, these are master controls which govern the way that the individual profiles work for each game. So once we're happy that everything is functional here, we can hit apply and okay. And that's gonna take us back to our main screen. So let's start off by talking about coded gaming. This is where the majority of people watching this video are gonna be spending most of their time. So as I mentioned earlier, you do need to download and install motion code for each of the individual sim racing titles which you intend to use. You can see I've already downloaded profiles for Assetto Corsa, ACC, Automobilista 2 and iRacing here. So it's as simple as once you're signed in with your account, you simply right click on the game that you wanna install. So we'll do Dirt Rally 2 here, install motion code, and it's gonna download it and then we can run through the wizard here. And it does also pop up a little browser window you can see here with instructions for how to actually install it. Runs you through the wizard and tells you if there's any additional steps that are necessary to actually get the game working itself. In most cases, there isn't. Most cases, everything just works straight out of the box. But if you have some sort of obscure game, then you may have to run through that. So it's great that it gives you that pop-up and explains all the steps that you need to do. And one of the things that I do really like about this system is even though it is quite complex in the number of different areas there are to set things up, it does walk you through the process quite efficiently. So you never really feel like you're on your own and you don't know what you're doing. So let's just quickly run through the installation wizard here for Dirt Rally 2. You can see it installs just like a regular program. And if you do want to uninstall that later on, you can just go into Add Remove Programs and remove that without removing the entire software package. So if you like to keep things tidy, 
that is cool as well. So with that motion code installed, what we can do now is go in and actually set up the profile to suit our liking. One other thing I should mention here as well is it will pop up and let you know if there's a motion code update available. You can download and install that at your will. So let's right click on ACC here and go to D-Box Haptic Settings. So this is just gonna load some basic default settings. We'll drag this little box down for you guys. And you can see again, we have a motion code master control here. So this is gonna sit one level below that master control that we saw before, which governs the entire system. So we've got a main output level here. So that's gonna be our force feedback strength. Again, a motion vibration balance and a motion profile. So we can save individual profiles and then switch between them. So if you wanna set up different profiles to different types of cars within an individual sim racing title, uh, say for example, you wanna be able to have a different profile for dirt versus tarmac, for example, you can do all that here. So we're gonna go across to motion profile editor. And this is where all the tweaking happens for our individual settings. So we can clone profiles here as well. So if you find something that you like, but you just wanna make a small tweak to it for another type of car, you can do that. And then obviously select between the different profiles with the drop down box here. So we can see here some check boxes to turn off individual types of feedback too. And then on the general motion, we've got our controls for our pitch, roll and heave, which is up and down. So pitch is forward to back movement, roll is side to side movement, and then heave is straight up and down. We've got three degrees of freedom with this system, as you guys already know. We've got similar adjustments here for yaw, which would be side to side movement or traction loss, as you guys might know it, and also surge, which is the entire rig sliding forward and back under acceleration and braking. Obviously, we don't have that on a three degrees of freedom setup, which is why those are both turned off. But if you do add those in later on, obviously they can all be controlled through the same software package, which is great. Now, if we scroll down here, one thing I do wanna mention is you do need to be careful with how you position your mouse when you're scrolling up and down here, because if you have your mouse over a slider, you can see it goes up and down like that, which isn't great. So it is very easy to accidentally make an adjustment here. Obviously, if you make an adjustment, you can close out and go back in and go back to the save profile. But if you've made a bunch of changes here, haven't saved yet and you mess something up by accident, it can be quite frustrating and it has happened to me a couple of times. So that is one thing that I hope they can fix. So then we've got an adjustment here for the intensity of our engine vibration effects. We can also choose between three, six or 12 cylinders, four, eight or 16, five or 10 cylinders, or automatic. I haven't found a scenario where automatic didn't work, so that has never needed to be touched. You can also set up custom RPMs here as well. So if you wanna make fine tuning adjustments to exactly how things feel, you can do that. And then it comes down into the more granular stuff. So suspension adjustment, surface texture adjustment, skid vibration, impacts, gear shift effects, and finally crash dampening. So you can see there's a huge amount of stuff that you can tweak here. And I'll run you through a little bit later on what my final settings were for this particular setup. But again, it is all gonna be very much personal preference here. But the important thing to note here, I think, is that there's more than enough adjustment here. You can wind things down to pretty much no movement or no haptic feedback at all, all the way up to really, really throwing you around in your seat to the point where it's hard to actually focus on the screens. So I can't see a scenario where there's not gonna be enough adjustment here. And the fact that there's so much granular adjustment too, I think is really good. You really can dial it in to feel exactly the way you like it to feel. So one other important thing to mention here is that it does automatically detect the game that you're launching, even if you launch it through Steam or from the desktop. So you don't actually need to launch the games from here, although you can, and it will automatically detect that game and initialize the motion code. So you don't need to go in here and switch profiles all the time, which is great. But I just wanna to quickly touch on adaptive gaming in a little bit more detail before we move on into our driving test. We are gonna skip over the coded video stuff for today. Uh, let us know in the comments below if you are interested in exactly how that works. We might put together a separate video. So let's click on adaptive gaming now and open up the adaptive gaming configurator, which is a separate app, which you launch from here. And just to give you a basic understanding of how this works, let's switch it on and get everything running. So if we go through here, we've actually got a bunch of tutorials which talk you through exactly how to set things up, which is really handy. And again, you really feel like you've got your hand held through this entire process, so you kind of know what you're doing and you're not really left in the dark, which is great. But what we can do here is we can set up individual effects for various different scenarios. So say, for example, every time I shift gear, I can set up a jolt through the system for a game that doesn't necessarily have force feedback built into it. So for example, here you can see there's already profiles set up for things like walking, player velocity, jumping, scrambling or dodging, sprinting, aiming through the sights, and you guys get the idea. So what I could do, for example, is I could set up as a starting point, activate or interact, and I'm gonna map that to my upshift on my controller. And then every time I press that, I'm actually getting a jolt through there. You can actually see the rig there moving. 
every time I do that. Now, obviously that is not configured to really feel like a gear shift at the moment. And then you can select from a bunch of presets here to find something that matches what you're after. So maybe say an explosion, for example. So let's, yeah, that feels much more realistic. So obviously this is gonna be a useful tool for those who wanna play games that don't have any force feedback, but wanna be able to create some of their own effects to get that little bit more immersion into the game. Now there is also an option for audio mode as well, which basically just takes the audio output from the game and creates effects based off that. So that is very similar to how a butt kicker system, for example, would work if you got it connected to a console where it can't actually read telemetry data. So it's just using the audio output to generate effects. So it's nowhere near as good as properly generated effects, but obviously it's better than nothing. All right, so what I wanted to do here is take you for a bit of a ride in a couple of different configurations here, just to kind of talk you through what I'm feeling in terms of sensation through the rig as I'm driving, because most people think of a full motion system as just kind of reacting to textures in the road, suspension movement, rather than communicating things like engine vibration, which is something that I absolutely love about the G3 system, which I run on my daily rig and have been doing for well over a year now. So much so that I actually ended up removing all the other types of haptic feedback that I had on my rig. So I took the butt kickers off. Uh, we tried a couple of other tactile transducers over the years as well, but just haven't really felt the need to run them with the tactile feedback that you get through these transducers. So they do a really good job of replicating those really fine vibrations through the rig as well. And you can feel, just as I accelerate here sitting in the pit, so I'm not doing anything else, really get a sense of that engine vibration rising and lowering, and even just the lumpiness of the engine underneath me as well, I can't just get that lumpy feeling. You're not gonna see much movement on the camera if, if at all, but I can feel that sensation in the seat of my pants. So if you're driving a car that has a really lumpy cam or something like that, you do actually get that sensation through obviously, again, depending on the quality of the force feedback and the telemetry data coming out of the game, of course. But if the data's there, they've done a really good job with their motion code of implementing it. So let's head out now. And what I wanted to do is run you through a couple of different configurations. We're gonna start off with just their default stock standard settings. And then I'm gonna show you the maximum settings. So things cranked up to the maximum. And I think you'll be surprised at just how much it throws me around. And then I'll show you how I like to have the settings set up as well. So as we go over this little bump here around Mount Panorama, you actually do get a sensation in the pit of your stomach of going over that crest. And that's one of the things I absolutely love about motion systems in general. It's one of the things I commented on with the uh, Next Level Racing seat mover as well. So you certainly don't need to spend this kind of money to get those sensations, but the level of fidelity that you get with systems like the D-Box and the, system, and the uh, Sigma Integrale system that we reviewed recently as well is something else. It is on another level. So as I'm going over the bumps here, like you can see I'm not really getting bucked forward to back here. That's simply because those particular parameters aren't cranked up as much as I probably want them. But I am getting a good amount of movement here just in the suspension compression. Cold tires will just be a little bit careful through here. And as we go through, you really, you can feel that body roll. You can really feel the car moving around. Now, one of the important things to understand with a motion system, and it seems a little bit counterintuitive because you'd think you're getting all this extra information that your brain can use to interpret what's going on with the car. In my experience, at least, and feel free to disagree with me on this. Let, let us know in the comments what your take is on this, but I've never found that any motion system actually made me faster or more consistent, which really did surprise me. But again, your, your, your mileage may vary on that one. But in my opinion, at least, motion really is just all about that immersion and just a sensation drawing you into the virtual environment. So you can see here, there's a few things that I would change about this default profile, and we'll get into that a little bit later on. But you can see there the range of movement that we have. And I always say as I crash into the wall, less is more when it comes to motion in general. And again, this is just my take, but you don't wanna have things cranked up to the point where it's throwing you around so much that you can't focus on the screens. There's a fine line between you know, adding immersion, adding information that your brain can actually use to get a deeper sense of immersion versus just throwing you around in the seat completely. And the other thing that's really important to understand is that you're wanting to sort of simulate the way your body moves in the seat of a car rather than actually you know, trying to emulate the movement of the car itself relative to the environment or relative to the road. So you don't wanna be looking at footage of a car driving along and sort of seeing how much the body of the car is moving and then trying to make it look like the rig is moving the same amount. It's far better to kind of study helmet cam footage. And you would have seen this 
in the recent comparison we did with some of James um, James Baldwin's footage from the uh, from the Spa 24 hour race recently what I did was I studied that footage and I took the time to try and replicate my own helmet cam so that the movement that I was seeing there was similar to what he was experiencing in the seat of his uh, of his real life race car and that was able to give me a good balance between the two. So let's jump in now, I'll show you what the what the, what it looks like set to its maximum settings. You'll see how much it throws me around, and then we'll come back and we'll show you my fine-tuned settings. So we're perched up the top of Mount Panorama with everything cranked up as high as I can get it without any clipping or cutting out. And uh, let's have a look at this. You can see already immediately the engine vibration is crazy. I don't know how much that's coming across on camera, but for me, I can see, you know, my legs are shaking, all the, the body fat that I have is rattling around on me, so it's pretty crazy. But let's head down the mountain now, and you guys will see, you'll hear in my voice how much it's throwing me around. Let's get underway. We'll just do a few corners like this. I just want to give you the impression of what this thing's capable of as it throws me around. It's so much that I can't really even see what I'm doing. Like, it's just shaking me around that much, but... I just wanted to give you guys a sense of what it looked like so you can see what the system is capable of and <laughs> that's enough for me. I'm going to throw up if I stay doing that. So let's, let's wind it back down to some more sensible settings now and I'll show you where I landed. Okay, so this is where I've landed with my settings based on my comparison with that real life footage the other day and just what feels good to me subjectively. And as I was kind of describing before, the balance here is trying to get all the sensations that I want out of the car so I feel more immersed and I feel like the car is communicating to me and I'm at one with the car, but without all the noise associated with just being thrown around in the rig like I was before. And I mean, it was, it was literally undrivable before. It was just throwing me around so much. So I've got that subtle engine vibration. I've got the body roll there that's kind of telling me what's going on with the car. So when I turn, you can see me kind of rolling towards the outside. And again, obviously we don't have sustained G-force here, so it's never gonna be simulating real life G-forces, but it does give you, again, that sensation of what the car's doing, but nice intense ripple strip effects as well. So I want those to be pretty profound, so I know when I'm hitting them. The road textures, the little bumps are quite profound as well, so I crank them up quite a lot from where they were by default. And then the rest of it's just fine tuning the suspension travel. So. I don't like to feel like I'm really bouncing around a lot. And again, it's gonna depend on the car you're driving, of course. If you're driving, say, dirt track, for example, you're gonna want a lot more movement than this. But you'll see, when I go over the crest here, the rig kind of moves forward, lurches me forward a little bit, gives me that sensation of undulation and movement, but without making me feel, feel like I'm floating through space. And that's one of the problems I often see with uh, the way some people have their motion set up. And again, it is a very subjective thing. I'm not saying that anybody's wrong, but for me at least, I don't want to feel like I'm floating around in space. I don't want to feel like I'm being, you know, I'm moving relative to the dash in the screen. And where it's sitting now, I feel like I'm at one with the vehicle without feeling like there's a separation there. I did just miss that apex, <laughs> but I'm not used to driving this car. When everything's working, when everything's dialed in and everything's the way you want it, it really does, for me at least, give me all those elements, all those levels to the, uh, to the overall impact of you know, feeling like you're inside a car that I want out of the rig. And like I said before, that's the reason why I ended up taking all the other haptic devices off my rig, my daily driver rig, because I just didn't feel like I needed them. And obviously there are some things that you can add, like maybe you know, force feedback pedals, you know, a bit of vibration there to give you, I guess, a little bit more sensation of some of those individual elements in terms of haptic feedback. But in, the, in terms of the sensation of engine vibration, car movement relative to the surface outside, so suspension movement, body roll, all those elements are so well reproduced with the D-Box system. One of the things that I absolutely love about it is the fact that it all feels very analog as well. There's no sort of sense of robotic sensation. Everything's very granular, very detailed, but also extremely smooth. So let's jump ahead now and talk about the overall conclusions when it comes to the G5 D-Box system. So let's dive into our pros and cons list now, starting with the pros. I've written down a list here so I don't miss anything, and we can kind of flesh out as we go along here. So first pro, which is probably, I guess, the biggest overarching 
observation of the experience with the system so far. Outstanding overall smoothness and analog feel whilst maintaining high levels of granular detail with no discernible latency. So you get a lot of detail there, ripple strips, track surfaces, all those details are there, but overall it has a very analog and smooth kind of feel to it. Uh, a lot of the other motion systems that we have tested over the years have had quite a robotic feel by comparison. You don't really notice it unless you tried something like this, but this is definitely a step above some of those other systems that we've tested. So along with the G3, because the experience actually using the G5 is exactly the same as the G3, the smoothest motion system that we've tested to date. Although the Sigma Integrale DK2 is close and it is significantly cheaper than this system is. So that is definitely one that's worth considering as well. And I would definitely recommend head on over to boostedmedia.net to check out the review of the DK2 system. So relatively quiet in operation, although the engine vibrations do make it very loud. So if you're just simulating suspension movement, it is pretty quiet. And I think you probably could get away with running this next door to somebody that was trying to sleep or study. But if you want to introduce engine vibration into it, forget about it. You're going to have to have a dedicated space. And uh, yeah, I can tell you from experience with the G3, given that this is the same volume, uh, I had that sitting on carpet on top of a concrete slab in my garage at my old house. And uh, my wife came running out to it figure out what the noise was the first time I fired it up. So uh, yeah, definitely something to consider. If you are gonna be forking out the money for something like this, noise is definitely something you do need to consider, but it is definitely on the quieter side of things as far as full motion systems go. So the actuators themselves are very smooth and quiet in operation. Engine vibration effect is just as immersive and arguably more so than the suspension movement. And that is important because it's something that is not present on some other motion systems. So definitely check to make sure if you are looking at alternative competitive products that may be cheaper than this, consider whether or not they actually simulate engine vibration. Now, the reason I say that is because in my experience running the G3, again, I was actually able to take off all the other tactile transducers that I had on my rig. I had a couple of butt kickers on there previously and the level of vibration tactile that I get from the D-Box system was enough. I just found that those systems were no longer necessary. So if you are looking at setting up a new rig and you're maybe considering getting a motion system and tactile transducers, then definitely factor that into the equation as well when you're pricing things up. If you're looking at getting a cheaper motion system, but you're gonna have to fork out for tactile on top of that, then that extra cost is likely something that you won't end up needing to spend if you do end up getting a D-Box. So next on the list, we had no large control module to mount on the rig. Now, admittedly, the G3 module with the, uh, with the mounting bracket that came from SimLab, when we installed that, actually ended up being quite convenient. We were able to mount it underneath the floor pan area here, and uh, it really wasn't something that got in the way. So again, depending on your rig and how it's set up, that may or may not be an issue for you. I actually think that I personally prefer the overall design of the G3 system. And the reason I say that is the actuators themselves have a smaller footprint. They look a little bit cleaner on the rig as well. But having said that, you will need to find somewhere to mount those control boxes with the G3. Whereas with the G5, all you have is that one small control box, which you can pretty much mount anywhere. And all the other electronics are all part of each individual actuator. So next up, I have high build quality, but not over engineered for sim racing like the G3. And one of the complaints that I have with the G3, I guess it's not really a complaint, but one of the observations that I have is that it does seem to be somewhat over-engineered for the context of sim racing. Now, those individual components that make up the G3 system are originally intended for use in cinema and commercial environments like that. So obviously they need to be able to, you know, withstand a lot of abuse that you're likely just not gonna be putting them through in the sim racing context. And while the hardware is very nice and it, you know, it, it screams high quality, I, th I felt like with the G3 system, you were paying for additional engineering and additional quality on top of what you probably actually needed. And that the experience in terms of actual usage could be just as good at a lower price point. And I feel like that's what's been achieved with the G5. Although the overall build quality is still very high, it's just not over-engineered to the same extent. And that manifests itself in things like, you know, thinner cables. We don't have those massive thick cables like we had on the G3. And that's gonna make things like cable management, for example, a lot easier with the G5 than it is with the G3. So I'm certainly not saying that the G5 is low quality compared to the G3. It's just that it's more suitably designed for sim racing, I would say. Now, everything that you need to get up and running is included in the kit, which is great. Uh, that's just with the exception of T-nuts if you are gonna be mounting to a aluminum profile rig. And there also wasn't any cable management included either. So getting back into the usage experience works with any game, including movies, although experience will vary and does require some setup. Now, another point that ties into that is that new motion code is released very quickly from D-Box. Uh, that has been my experience in the 18 months that I've been using the G3 and ongoing support has been very good as well. So there has been a few significant software upgrades in those 18 months. And then lastly on the pros list, once installed and up and running, software is easy to use to the extent that you won't even see it day to day unless you want to get in and adjust settings. So as you saw, 
saw earlier, it does automatically detect and load the profile for whatever game you happen to be running. So unless you want to change between cars or something like that, you don't even ever need to open up the software, which is really great. So it just runs in the background. You never even need to see it. Having said that though, the initial setup was a little bit more complicated than it perhaps needed to be. There were multiple software packages that need to be installed. And depending on what you want to do, you have to open a different program as well. That Control Hub software does tend to launch all the various different software packages that you might need. But if you want to upgrade the firmware, it's a different executable file and that did confuse me for quite some time. Had to go back and forth with support a little bit with that one just to get my head around it. So yeah, it could be it could be simpler, but once you're up and running, it is very good. And I will say that the documentation is very good there as well. So there are a couple of weird scenarios where you might get a little bit stuck, uh, like I did with the firmware updating. But other than that, you know, just plug and play getting up and running with games. You do feel like you're being supported the whole way through with quick start guides, tool tips, and all those sorts of good things. So getting into our cons list now, multiple software packages was initially confusing as we just discussed. Would like to see that simplified. Not a huge fan of having to register just to use the product. That didn't used to be the case, but with the later versions of the software, you do need to register to be able to download the motion code for the various different SIM titles. And just to unpack that a little bit further, I also didn't really appreciate being automatically signed up for a free trial of the coded video service. Now, importantly, it didn't ask me for any payment details when I did register that account. So it's not like they can start charging me automatically once that trial has expired. So that is a good thing. For me, you know, it, it just did feel like a little bit of a slap in the face having to pay extra for something on top of, you know, something that already costs so much money. So definitely consider that as well. That feature is a good thing to have and we will explore that later on in more detail. But, you know, you do have to pay extra every month to use it. So other than that, really, it was just small nitpicks when it comes to the hardware. So multiple cables to each corner can get messy if not properly cable managed. And I do feel like some form of cable management should be included at this price point. Now, having said that, of course, as we mentioned before, the cables are a lot thinner than they were with the G3 system. The bend radius is a lot tighter, so it is a lot easier to route them around on your rig. But if you're not careful, it can become a cable spaghetti mess quite quickly. One other small little nitpick was that the included mounting brackets only had M6 holes. Uh, I would prefer to have M8, just give you that little bit of extra strength. Easy to drill them out though, so you know if it bothers you, you can easily fix it. But yeah, I'm sure they have a reason for doing it that way. Would have preferred M8 personally. And then lastly, just the large mounting surface where the actuators bolt to the rig may make installation a little bit more difficult on some rigs. And overall just doesn't look quite as tidy as the G3 in my opinion. So in conclusion, while it is very, very expensive, for something that ultimately isn't likely to make you any faster or more consistent. The immersion that this thing provides is something that I really do wish every single person could experience. And so the price drop from the G3 is definitely something that I think is welcome. That said though, it is still significantly more expensive than the Sigma Integrale DK2 system as we reviewed recently. And again, I would definitely recommend check out the review that we did on that DK2 system. There are some areas where I do feel like this has the upper hand, but when you consider the price difference, I think that it is definitely something that is worth considering before you jump in and spend this kind of cash. But overall, I've got to say it's a very well engineered system. The G3 system, we've been running 18 months now, as I said, uh, we've had absolutely no issues in terms of reliability with that whatsoever. It's been absolutely rock solid and flawless the entire time that we've had it. So I can only expect a similar experience with the G5 system as well. So I guess the big question is, is this system worth the money? Now, I think, you know, like 7,100 US dollars is a huge amount of money to be spending on a sim rig. And there's no way around that. I think really what it boils down to honestly is this. I think if you've already got all of the other gear that you could possibly want on your rig, so you've got high-end pedals, you've got a high-end wheelbase, you know, all the steering wheels you want, solid cockpit, which you're gonna need anyway to run a system like this. If you've got the money and there's nothing else left to spend it on, then by all means, go ahead and buy something like this. I think you're gonna be blown away with it and you're gonna absolutely love it. You're certainly not gonna regret the purchase by any means. Again, of course, just considering the fact that it is mostly for the immersion factor. It's not likely to make you a faster overall driver. But I think if you're building a rig for the first time and you're trying to prioritize your spending, I think maybe if you've got say $12,000 to spend and you're wondering whether you want to pour, you know, a whole bunch of money into something like this and then, you know, cut some corners in some other areas, I would absolutely say, you know, put the money into things like pedals, wheelbase and solid cockpit first. This is something that we've talked about many, many times on the channel, but those are the things that are genuinely going to make you a faster and more consistent driver. And then something like this is more just the icing on the cake. It's definitely an awesome system and I absolutely love it. I don't want to take away from that, but when you're spending this kind of money on what is essentially a hobby, I think you do need 
need to have your expectations in check. You do need to be aware of what this will and won't bring to the table. And I really hope that today's review has helped make that clear for you guys. So as we mentioned at the top of the review, check out our website, boostedmedia.net for a written version of this review as well. You'll also find some affiliate links there if you do wanna pick up one of these systems or if you wanna have a look at any of the other motion systems which we reviewed over the years here at Boosted Media. We've got a growing list of affiliate resellers there which are a great way to help support the channel at no additional cost to you if you are looking at buying any sim racing hardware. So we really appreciate your support there. And there are a couple of discount codes there as well. So definitely make sure you check that out. Links will be down in the description below. But as I said before, I really hope that today's video has helped you guys out. If it has, please leave a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to the channel as well if you haven't already. Only about 30% of the people that are watching these videos are subscribed. And subscribing is a great way of telling YouTube that this content is valuable. So it shows it to other sim racers like you. So we really appreciate that too. But thank you very much for watching guys. And I will see you again in the next one. Bye.